economic side, the side I'm going to look at first in here. All right, the economy after World War I. War is good for the economy, normally. As long as you're not fighting on your land. But for the United States, it was really good because what fighting took place on our continent? Really none. While it was being fought in Europe, we had it where we were making things and made a lot of money. Um, we had a slight recession, and then we had the 1920s was a boom time for us. Now, the reason why, first of all, productivity. Each worker producing more things, that made us, us better. Um, that's where the technology comes in. And electricity. By this time, all those little inventions that seem like neat little things that, that Tom Edison were making, now we have more and more of those things that are able to be used. And, you, and factories are getting faster and better. During World War I, the gold that was in Europe came into the United States. And even afterwards, when Britain and France were repaying their loans, that gold kept coming into the United States. Um, and actually, if you kind of look at the history of the world, where the most powerful countries are, where is the gold going? Um, you can go back to the Spanish, and then later on, when the British took over, and mercantilism made them richest, but then it kind of goes to the United States. And here's why people sometimes fear today, where is the gold heading now? What country are we? China. As we are having to pay our national debt, which they're getting more and more of our securities that way. Um, and our government policies overall, we're very pro-business. We helped out businesses in here. It was really good, except for there were some signs that it was bad. But do you all always, when, when things are going good overall, do you ignore the little things? And that's kind of what happened with the United States. All right, the Great Migration. I know some of this isn't quite in the order of your notes that you have in here. Skip around a little bit in the first part. The Great Migration continues. What was the Great Migration? Black right, the blacks that were moving from the south to the northern cities. Um, it started in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Came to its peak during World War One when they were coming to factories. But it would continue on in the early 20s. Now, as the blacks got to these cities of the north, the whites there and the different groups, they, they had open arms and, and wished them well, right? Uh, this is where they found some other, and I'm going to show a clip sometime here soon. It's like the race riots that occurred in Chicago in the, during the basically the early 20s or just before that time. Um, there. So it wasn't quite as good as thought. Um, there was not that, Taylor, this is where we have the de jure and de facto. We did not have segregation by law, but they had a lot of things by custom in the northern cities. All right, and here's the map again kind of showing with the Great Migration as they head to the various cities. And notice also, that's also where a lot of blacks were moving to California too. I would say north, uh, but California is included in that also. All right, farmers. World War I was really good for them. Why was World War I good for farmers? Troops yeah. that is food, who else needed food? Europe. Europe. They're fighting on their land. So for American farmers, they keep it. they made a lot of money. Now what did those farmers do with the money? Yeah, they spent it on new tractors. And are they able to then produce even more food? We also have at this time, this is where our science is making differences. We have fertilizers, different hybrids. We're, we're using science to improve our agriculture. Remember we had the Morrell Land Grant Act to make these land grant colleges and like University of Florida would have an agricultural school, Texas A&M. They are studying and they're learning how to put science with agriculture and make it better. But we're getting the effects of it. Pest control with pesticides there. Now, advances equals more food. Once Europe comes out to peace, are they able to grow their own food? So do they need to buy as much of our food? So there's less demand from Europe, but we're growing more food. More food supply is less demand. That will equal lower prices. That's good for the consumers. 
why not for farmers? I mean, right, they're not making as much um, in here. One part that goes with this, here's where this seems like, in the big scheme of things, the idea is what I, I hope you remember, but those of you that remember details, uh, for some reason or another, the college board will throw this in for a lot of things in here. But a law, law was proposed, uh, and it was passed, but then the president vetoed it, but it would basically it gave a floor. Uh, what if it by parity, everybody's equal? This bill would say that farmers were not allowed to lose money. So they would at least get their costs back. And that's one of the problems that we have in agriculture. And as a family that was in agriculture for years, um, if you're in agriculture, kind of look at it. One out of every five years, you're going to make a lot of money. One out of every five years, you're going to lose your tail. The other three years, you kind of break even. You just kind of, kind of hope that it all evens out. Uh, there. I mean, good years, you put aside some money for when you have bad years. You don't know when is there going to be a drought, when is there going to be too much rain. Um, here in Florida, when is there going to be a freeze that's got our oranges? All right, when, are, when are we going to have citrus caker come in and, and kill off some orange groves? So that had that. Now I have on here, why is it un American? It's like communism. Uh, it's more like everybody. Well, it is sort of like communism because communism says everybody's equal. Yeah, that's not that's not. We're about competition, the free enterprise system. If you take a chance and make more money, great. But what if you lose it? That's your loss. It's your risk. The more risk you take, the more money you might make. All right. Um, I have this part. Later in the decade, hard time for farmers. They entered the depression before the stock market crash. Anyone know why? When we look at 20s and things were so good, like 1925 was great for America, but the farmers were already in bad shape. Because of the Dust Bowl and how much they used the land? The Dust Bowl was already starting, so that contributed to it. Plus, for a lot of them, this whole thing of having lower prices, they maybe are trying to pay off loans that they have, and their farm, more and more farms are getting foreclosed. Now, I know you're not in economics, but here is your simple economics lesson. The basis for all economics come down to supply and demand. And you need to know this. We actually, on the, the Florida intercourse exam, they actually have, will have some questions that do with basic economics. And I know you're saying, well, we haven't had economics yet. So this, this is where I'm kind of showing you the basic thing that you have. And if you look at it, and this is most you can do it. The higher the price, okay, the less the amount of people want to buy it. If McDonald's is selling a hamburger for $5, yeah. are they going to sell very many of them? Yeah. No. No. But do they have a large supply of it for $5? Yeah, they're willing to sell a whole lot. And what ends up happening is you have, and this is what's called an equilibrium price. And here, as the price gets lower, more and more people want it, but they want a less and less supply. A lot of people will like 25 cent hamburgers, but are there many places that are gonna sell 25 cent hamburgers? So that's what we have. Now let's take it though, if we're saying wheat. Farmers wanna sell it at a high price. People aren't willing to buy it. But this is where we end up with the equilibrium price. The problem was, if you look at this, we have the, su the supply changes, where demand comes, comes the same, there's more supply, so the price goes down. But we also not only had the price go down, we had demand go down because Europe isn't buying it. So once again, the price goes down again. So, so this is where the farmers had a double whammy occurring them uh, to them in the 1920s. Again, I know it's something you're not used to with the economic side, but more supply will be lower price, which comes back to that same question we had. That is good for the farmer or for the consumers. If a person went to the store to buy food, it's cheaper. But is it good for the farmers? And that's where why we would end up having a lot of those farmers start to go. How does Walmart be able to like sell the food at a cheap price if they buy it from local farmers? Well, that's why they end up not most of what they buy isn't always from local farmers. Then they buy in bulk, and that's why a place like a Walmart is able to go and get 
um, things and they can divide it up. And if you're a person and you know Walmart's going to buy a whole bunch of this, all right, you'll sell them to, to a low at a lower price because you know they're going to buy two thousand of whatever you have instead of this person buying fifty, this person twenty-five, that person thirty. Okay, you got that one constant market. Uh, when I had my business, I actually had for a short time that I was with a business one that made dive flags, um, but almost 50% of that company's revenue came from Walmart, um, and another 40% from a, a string of dive, dive shops up and down the East Coast, which meant that pretty much 90% of all its revenue came from two sources, uh, which for me was a thing that was really scary, because Walmart is known to, when you have a company, you have all this, and they decide, oh, we're not going with you this year, we're going to this company in China. And I would have been sitting there with basically like $100,000 worth of dive flags that I had to make because when Walmart says they want it, they want it like three weeks later. So um, I gave it to someone that was willing to take more of that risk. It was a high profit business um, there, but it was something that for me was too risky because I couldn't risk that. The guy that bought that, he had all kinds of money, all right? He could sit for a year or two and, and eventually sell because dive flags don't go bad. But that's for him, it wasn't a problem. All right, I didn't have the money to be able to sit. He was actually a big president. So for him, he had a lot of extra money. It was good for him. So he could, he could play the game. He got All right, manufacturing. And this last section we'll do today here. Um, battle with the union influence. Remember unions got really strong in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Factory owners were trying to figure out right, what to do. Teddy Roosevelt and things started becoming a little bit more pro-union, or at least they were giving them an equal footing. So it was no longer the old where Andrew Carnegie had his factory that basically you do what I want, I don't care um, what your demands are. Now they're trying to work with it. Well, sometimes you look at it and say, how can we curb their union on um, there? Now I say both positively and negatively. Put stars or highlight this this word because this is got, this is one that confuses people. It is known as vocabulary wise as welfare capitalism. I'm not even I can't even remember exactly where the welfare came from except for welfare so things that people want for for good welfare. But it's not where a lot of you think welfare as handouts to people or are people that are in need. But it gave people some things to want. Do workers want to work in a shorter work week? Go from a six-day work week to a five-day work week and have weekends off. Yeah. If the pay's not cut. Right, if their pay's not cut. And that's what some of the factories looked at doing. What if you get now start getting vacations to them? More safety things. If you're working for Henry Ford's factory and he's paying you well, he actually paid a higher salary than the other other factories. And he's given you a, two days off. He's given you some vacation time. Do you really want part of your pay going to a union? No. And that's where the, the factory owners kind of look at this. We make people happy, we'll keep the unions weaker. So let's do some of the things beforehand and do it. The other thing that we had, and, I, and this is where we're going to take something that you're, the term you're going to need to know economic-wise, and it's going to come up a couple times in American history. What became known as the American plan. And here's where you need to know the difference between a closed shop and an open shop. A closed shop says you must join the union if you work in that factory. Okay? You, must you must join the, the union. An open shop says you have the choice. Okay. Uh, you put it right here behind. All right, but that's where the difference is for a closed shop and an open shop. A lot of states ended up or make it where you're open shop. Today we call that they're a right to work state. Uh, Florida is a right to work state. You do not have to, you cannot be forced to join a union. Um, was in the news recently as the state of Michigan had a law signed by the governor. They're now a right to work state, which was one of the most pro union states there was. But can't you make more money in the union? Yes, but if you're a factory owner, do you want. Yeah, because my brother just moved to New York and his pay was $19 an hour. And right. he said if you join the union after three months, you made $22 an hour. Right. And that's, and that's where some things 
that you have, and that's where New York's a pro-union state. Okay. So. All right, we're going to stop there. I don't want to get too far today, but we got way off topic on all kinds of stuff. Trying to curb unions. We saw what had happened with the Soviet Union or Russia, and two ways they did it, both positively and negatively. One is they tried to give a lot of the things that unions would be fighting for, kind of cut them off for a pass, but then also make laws that would make it where it was harder for, for unions to exist. And that's where closed shops and open shops, and, we're going, and that term's going to come up again in the 1940s, and actually in today's history, we also have that. A closed shop is one in which which you are required to be in a union. The open shop is you have the choice whether or not. Um, state of Florida, we are a right to work state, which means that you cannot make it where we're a closed shop. Now for the political side, this is the re a Republican decade. Um, when you have your, for your president's quizzes, okay, which we have one coming up um, this week here, but for your president's quizzes, this is a time period for 1920s. It is controlled by the Republicans. The 1920 election was the first in which women could vote. And it really scared a lot of people. And how are women going to vote? What if women made their own party? If we had Republicans, Democrats, and a woman's party, the women would control everything. But how did the women end up voting? The same as their families. families. Yeah, basically the same as their husband or their father. Uh, what we call political socialization. Most people that end up, your biggest um, influence that you have on your political ideals is your family. Um, so that's what ended up happening. Harding wins. And for Harding, he was seen as a good looking guy. Pretty much he's going. His quote in his campaign uh, slogan was return to normalcy. He basically created a new word with normalcy. It was not a word in the English language before he used it for a slogan, and he ends up winning. Um, notice that I have, besides the Democrat, Debs ran at this time also, so the Socialist Party is still around in 1920. Uh, but it would be after this time when they just basically pretty much die off to being a very small um, party there. Um, I can't remember if 20 if he was in jail on this one or not. He said I mean, he was from jail. Okay, from, okay. So 20 was the one who was in jail. Yeah, he because because um, Deb's got in prison several different times for various various things of protesting with the, the government. So uh, that's why one of the, the famous campaign buttons that that you have is one where they're voting for convict number and have a picture of them. So you're allowed to run for president from jail. Yes, I mean he had he had done the Socialist Party could nominate their candidate. And he fulfilled the qualifications that the Constitution says, which is you have to be a natural born citizen, 35 years old. There, so he had not lost his citizenship. Okay, 1924 election, after Harding dies, Coolidge takes over. Things are going pretty good. It was an easy election. Now you notice the third name for here, which is actually more important than their Democrat, John Davis. Napoliet. So what party has now gone and bit, become our biggest third party? Yeah, the Progressive Party. Okay, it's not Teddy Roosevelt, but Lafoliet is running. Um, he actually was gaining some steam until he had some health problems. Other. But Coolidge wins this election pretty easy. It was very, very popular overall. 1928, we will have Ho Herbert Hoover, who is basically handpicked by Coolidge. A lot of people, I mean, he was one of the brightest minds that we have in the United States in World War II, uh, World War I, sorry, he, he had uh, headed with our Food Administration Board, so he had shown early on he was a very capable person. If you look at a resume, we don't have very many people that ever ran for president that had a better resume on paper than Herbert Hoover. So why is he seen by so many people as one of our biggest failures? Depression. Yeah, the Great Depression. The Great Depression. Sure. Now, the Great Depression occurs in his first year as president. Is it his fault? No. Yeah. No, for the most part. It. But if you're president, when bad things happen, you get blamed for it. If good things happen while you're president, you get you get basically the credit for it. It's just kind of when you're sitting sitting out in that office, you get that. Now, the Democrat in this case was is Al Smith. Uh, there were a lot of people that voted for against him, and 
Does anyone know why Al Smith had some areas, especially in the South, even though the South still voted very Democrat, but some areas that, and some people that did not vote for Al Smith? There's one thing about him that some people did not it's trust. Slavery. Slavery's been long gone. Okay. <laughs> didn't like his last name. Didn't like his last name? Yeah, I know that's a name you just can't trust, the person with the last name Smith, right? Not in America. Yeah, like his first name. Al? John Smith. Yeah. Why? This is religion. What? Oh, let me guess. He was Catholic. Oh. Okay, he was Catholic. And you're going to see this in the 1920s, especially. We have a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in the 1920s. Remember with the immigrants? Uh, well, we have this with Al Smith. And part of what you have with, with them is the fact um, that a lot of people will not vote for a person that is Catholic. Now, I have on here this question. This is, of all the people, not so much presidents, is it, but who you, who's the most important? Andrew Mellon. Yes, Andrew Mellon. Um, for the the three presidents, it's not that they aren't important, but this is a decade in which Andrew Mellon had a bigger impact. That little clip that, that we saw, the third richest man in America, he was he was on the cabinet for all three of these men. He is one of the, basically the person that sets the whole business tone that we have for that decade. Which our next section is basically about that decade. I know you really want to get in deep into the economic side, but we're not going to go that deep in it. Our Secretary of Treasury is Andrew Mellon. Now, yes. how, how many years was he Secretary of Treasury? Basically, the, almost the entire decade. I can't remember if he was. Because he went, because uh, I know he was for Harding and Coolidge, and I can't really remember for sure if Hoover continued on with him in the beginning. So, how did he not see the depression coming? And that's where they said he's so rich that it didn't affect him. If does Bill Gates kind of does he notice when the prices of food keep inching up? No. No, and that's kind of the way that Andrew Mellon was. And where Coolidge was very trusting of him, he's a brilliant man. Uh, there, so we're, I'm going to trust him to keep making the right decisions. And sometimes when you have that, you'll have a group of leaders. And they just don't see things. Because everything seemed to be going great. And, and I'm not going so much into the cause of the depression in this part, but when we get to the depression, this is where there was some fun path. All right, you may not remember this tariff straight out. One of the reasons why I put this in is the fact that this is one that the Florida in the course exam has seemed to have had. Uh, the college board in the past hasn't thought this was important for, for AP. But... In the 1920s, if they want something pro-business, they raise tariffs up. So the Republicans are pro-business, they raise the tariffs up. One thing that we have, and then we have this argument going on today, do we make more regulations or less regulations? In other words, rules, like when it comes for banking today. That's what put us in our last crisis. Well, do we need to have more regulations on this? But if you're a business owner, you say that's government coming in and too many handcuffs. Oh, there's too much red tape. Why do a business if the government's not going to allow me to do things? And the Republicans eased up on a lot of those regulations. But because of the capital welfare system, a lot of it didn't really matter because a lot of factories, even though there weren't laws saying they had to be safer, they went ahead and made their, made their factories safer. Again, because they were afraid with the unions. So it was working out good then. Here is the key thing, and this is going to reappear in history time and time again. This is not tickle down, as for some reason every year I have someone thinking it's tickle down. It is trickle down <laughs> economics. Um, the idea of trickle down to economics is we give a tax cut to the wealthiest people. If you are a very rich person and you pay less taxes, what are you going to do with that extra money that is now no longer going to Uncle Sam? You're going to keep it for yourself. That's a world idea. Party. All right. You're going to, some of you kick. You're going to spend it. You're going to party. You're going to keep it for yourself. This is where the idea trickle down is that they're going to spend it or they're going to expand their factories. So if I if I do spend more money, am I going to create more jobs that way? If I add on to my factory, am I creating more jobs? 
And the idea is that if you have more jobs, even though they might, the rich person might be paying less taxes, taxes that's going to trickle down to people that are poor. There have been times that you can back that up, that up in history and say it has worked. There are times that you can kind of back it up and say it hasn't worked. Uh, we look, and later on, it'll be used by a Democrat, John F. Kennedy, to help spur the economy. The 1980s, Ronald Reagan would do that. Our most recent example would be the Bush tax cuts that we had, which some people argue both ways. Uh, we have people that in economics will say that the Bush tax cuts are one of the things that, that made, our, our, made it worse. Uh, for our recession. Other people will say that if we didn't have the Bush tax cuts after 9-11, we may have gone deeper into a recession. Um, this is where there's different economic philosophies. But the idea is that you have it and, you, and it will trickle down to, to common people. And again, this is going to come back again. We're going to see it in a lot, a lot of cartoons when we get to Ronald Reagan. It is the debate that we have right now in our government. Should we raise taxes back up on the rich? Okay, and this is where for Obama and Congress, where we have had this argument over the last three weeks, actually, um, and the, and the, with the bill that was made before the debt ceiling crisis. All right, sometimes called the Coolidge Prosperity. Things went so, so good. This is where we kind of see how unrealistically they were. In 1928, Hoover had suggested that poverty was going to be eliminated soon. <laughs> Was he a little off on his prediction about poverty in 1928? But if you're around a whole bunch of people and everything's good, do you really think of anything bad? And that's what ends up was happening at that for our leaders. And they didn't realize some of the undercurrents, what was happening to farms during the 1920s. Okay. What was happening in some of the factories that everything looked good, but as they were building up inventory. What was happening overseas? And all these things were coming together. All right, Harding had the luck that some presidents would only hope for. When he died, everybody thought that he was one of the greatest presidents we had, because things were going good. But after he died, a lot of these scandals came out. Um, part of the problem was the people he chose. Known as the Ohio Gang. Sometimes it is known as the Poker Gang. gang because they played a lot of poker. Now, this is during the period of Prohibition, and there was a whole lot of alcohol going through the White House during Prohibition. Yes. Okay. Harding and his Ohio gang were pretty good partiers. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Okay, You pass a law saying for people you cannot have it. You have federal agents going around trying to catch people that are producing or selling liquor, and yet in the White House it is flowing freely for President Harding. Um, now, same thing that happened with President Grant really happened with Harding. He picked a lot of his friends to be on the cabinet. Think of, if you were to say, your 10 best friends. Would some of those be people you wouldn't put in an important job that you have to trust with money and millions of dollars, billions of dollars? And your name, when they make a mistake, you're the one that's going to be blamed for it. And Harding, he was very trusting of people, and some of those people that went, and that's where we would end up having the problem. There were a lot of scandals, but the one that falls out, and you see the cartoon on the bottom left, actually both sides, Teapot Dome. And to kind of keep it real simple, you need to know the main person that gets blamed. Who's the main person that gets blamed with Teapot Dome? Yeah, Albert Fall, okay? Harding's dead by the time we find out, and we find out that Albert Fall is getting kickbacks, and what ended up happening was it involves oil, and to kind of make it real simple, there was lands that were out west that apparently somebody knew there was oil underneath it, and the federal government leased it to other people for a lot cheaper than it would be than if you actually knew there was oil underneath it. And then later on, Albert Fall gets a kickback from that. Um, and so that is where we would end up with this biggest scandal. All right, Red Scare, what are we scared of? And we had before with this, the Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. After World War I to get started, and during the 1920s, this is really going as the beginning. We'd have the Palmer raids, and we're going after the IST, communist, socialist, anarchist. They've got to be bad. The 
the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. They had basically a couple things that was wrong with them. One, they're Italian. Two, they're anarchists. And three, they're immigrants. And that's basically enough that if there's sketchy evidence on their crime, let's go ahead and convict them. Um, and But it kind, of, it kind of brought up and, and shows some of the things with the Red Scare, where we're going after. It's a witch hunt. Now, here's where we get the whole thing with the new immigrants and old immigrants. Some of the things that had happened before, the Dillingham Report had blamed things on immigrants. So what should we do in order to stop this? And, and there it comes coming. Now we get to one of the weird things for the 1920s. This is the Klan Decade. And I'm going to show you some video clips and some things for, for the Klan. If you see this picture, we have the Ku Klux Klan traveling down Pennsylvania Avenue. And when I show you some of the video of it, we're not talking about one small group. You're going to see thousands and thousands of people marching down. The thing about the KKK at this time was that it was seen as something that was American. They're trying to protect American ideas. This isn't considered No. We would have, I don't remember how many senators, um, and if I can get the one clip to come on, that will have, they'll tell you. But there are several, several senators that are card-carrying members of the KKK. We have Supreme Court justices that are KKK members. They are part of what are called claverns. Okay, and get, and this is a word, this is an SFI to remember with claverns. A clavern is kind of like your local club that you would get involved with, that you're part of KKK. It'd be like being part of the Elks Club. Okay, or the American Legion. Yeah. Are the acts of the KKK unconstitutional? Well, it's what? It's against human rights. I mean. Well, this is where it depends on what exactly they're doing. Because in a lot of the places, what they're doing is they would go into churches and they would recruit people from the churches. Now, not Catholic churches, because the KKK is against Catholics. So you go into a Protestant church. So you would have, and the pastor might even invite them in and take a donation up because they are fighting for good, honest Americans. And this is where the idea of Americanism was tied in right with the KKK. Um, notice I have Midwest. When most of you think of the KKK, where do you think the strength of the KKK is? Yeah. Yeah, usually you're thinking Alabama, Mississippi. One state is known as the Klan state at this time. Not Texas. New Mexico. Indiana. Indiana is the Klan state. And you're going to see this guy, David Stevenson, who was the leader of the Klan. And he controlled politics for several years in the state of Indiana. Now, in the South, the Klan is still, their major focus is against African Americans. But in the North, and where the strength of the KKK was at that time then, it would be against immigrants, against Catholics, against Jewish people, and, and that is where it's trying to come. Is the KKK didn't like African Americans and Martin Obama? What? Well, this is where today compared to the do you, well, do you think Obama would have had a chance in the KK, with the KKK? Uh -huh. No. And here's where, looking at Americanism, and you're going to see, hopefully, see, see on this, you know, I'm saying this, I'm not sure if this clip will play, if it's the right one that I have on here. Um, I'm trying to find. But you'll even see in 1924, the Klan ballot, and they'll put K's with everything, to vote for Calvin Coolidge, because they put it with the K's. What? Okay, and they're supporting Calvin Coolidge. Because he's for Americans. The Democrats, okay, they're Smith, he's Catholic. Okay, that's not American. All right, that'd be, that's, the immigrants are supporting this. Um, and this is where you kind of have this in yellow. 
Um, some people will point today and say we have the same thing, or point, people will start pointing and sometimes say when the, instead of using other things, they'll start yelling socialist and start calling anything socialist instead. You're not American, you're socialist. Um, and so, so that is where you, you will see with the plan. What time uh, did the party split? Like when like Democrats became one of the Republicans? That'll be after Franklin Roosevelt is when we kind of will have the flip flop with the North and the South and the the realignment of the parties that way. All right, some different SFIs to know. We had WASPs before, but what does WASPs stand for? Right, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. Here's where the base of the clans were. Here's a word, and this is something that goes with the 1920s. They're trying to protect Teutonic stock. Realistically, if you want to put this for something we had before, the Teutonic stock is the old immigrants. The groups that were Americans before are these Italians, these Russians, these Greeks that have moved to America in the last couple decades. Are they American? No. No. If you're English background, French, we'll even accept the, uh, the Irish by that time. That is Teutonic stock. That's good American stock. So people get in my say this is kind of happening again. Are immigrants that are coming from Latin America, are those good Americans? Do people even, no, no, we've got to stop that. And, this, and again, you kind of look at this, and we have a repeat of uh, time and time again where we have for nativism um, and the, the old guards. But realistically, for the client of that time, they were for America, for Christian values. And there's a lot of reasons for with the, the cross, a lot of things that, that they base. Um, some of these will be shown that. Clip, but they're against the foreigners, which then they'll use that political power to get some laws passed on there. Again, for blacks in the South, that still was something that they had. Now, I mentioned about Indiana, okay, and led by a guy by the name of David Stevenson, with that being the Klan state. What was what group of people were moving in large numbers to Indiana? <laughs> well, we do have blacks with the great with the Great Migration that have moved in a couple of decades before this. So is that changing the landscape of Indiana? Um, well, the Swedish aren't coming this time, but we do have other immigrants, especially like Gary, Indiana, and areas like that along the northern part. So you have immigrants coming in, and they're changing the makeup of Indiana. So that's why Indiana was one. Um, it would rise very rapidly, and then it would die back down. Were we, well, I'm going to add another section for that. Okay. What did you say? Calvin. Oh, the cap. That's basically, it was like clubs that you evolved. And it would be something that, again, it was seen as something, if you're a good businessman, a good Christian businessman, you join the clan. I don't, it doesn't seem like that, but you have to put yourself in 1920. Okay, not this year, 1920. Um, and I will tell you, this is one of the key things that you'll find on test they'll look and see when, what your knowledge is of the, K, of the KKK. If you're thinking the only thing is with the KKK is against blacks, all right, they'll have questions. Not that they're trying to trick you, all right, but they're trying to see. Do you really know that the KKK was basically against anybody that wasn't WASP? All right, is what it comes down to. All right, the Dillingham report has said that we we needed to basically take care of problems of there that came out from the from the immigrants. Here's two laws. Put stars by this. Arrows. Know these two laws. First one was passed in 1921. And it is the Quota Act. And what it did is it went by the 1910 census and looked at things and said, if we had 100,000 people that were from, that were Greek ancestry in America, then we're only going to allow 3,000 in each year from Greece. Now, we would turn around three years later and make another law, and we would go from 3% to 2%, and use the 1890 census, which means we're letting even less of these new immigrants in. Because when did most of the Italians move into America? Before or after 1890? Okay, after. So there were too many Italians that had moved in, all right, by 1910. So that's why they moved it back to 1890. Okay, so there'd be less Italians, less Russians, less Greek less of these new immigrants coming in. What if you're trying to move here and you're from Germany? Nope. 
or England or France. Pretty easy to get in still. But except for Germany, there weren't a whole lot. And actually, Germany didn't have huge amounts coming in. Um, but that's what. Remember those two things in the quota. We're going to limit the numbers. This is a famous cartoon that you'll see over and over again, where we have all these immigrants that want to come to America, and we have a funnel, and what it says on there is 3%. So what is that cartoon about? Yeah, the Quota Act. Okay. Um, okay, how did the Red Scare and the rise of the KKK go along with this idea? Yeah, they're not American. And this is why I want you to kind of make these connections together. The KKK, this, the Quota Act, and what about prohibition laws? How does that fit in against immigrants? Yeah, they were seen as the drinkers. Okay, we got these Italians who are drinking too much. And even though some of them, like Harding, are drinking themselves, they can handle it. They, they do what was, because they were a superior race. How about marijuana laws? They would be passed in the 19, late 20s, early 30s. Why did we make marijuana illegal when it wasn't before this time? And a great show for somebody to watch, they have the, the History Channel comes with it periodically, is the history of drugs. Um, the one on cocaine and the one on marijuana actually have a lot of good history. Some of them are kind of weird, but that the one on marijuana actually has a lot of great history. Um, showing some movies and all, like or clips from the 1920s movie called Reefer Madness. Um, and thanks, and, and Tom, you know, there's actually some good background. But why did we why did we outlaw marijuana in the United States in the 1930s? Can you tax it. Well, we needed it. We were actually. Well, and that's part of it actually. And this is where going for a word today, the interest groups. There were interest groups that had that. What two groups of people were the most likely to be using marijuana in the 1920s? Mexicans, Indians, and uh, not Native Americans, but it'd be blacks. Uh -huh. So does that kind of are they kind of going after? I mean, the two two groups are so we can, you can kind of look and say is there a race involved mm -hmm. and the reason why we outlaw? Which the person that was put in charge of outlawing marijuana and this is one of the scenes I remember in that for the History Channel with the history of drugs. He's standing looking over the Potomac River and he looks across it and he sees a field of marijuana just growing wild. I mean, there's a reason why it's called weed. Okay, mm -hmm. it, grow, it grows better than almost anything else, except for in any place in the United States, except for the permafrost area. And he's thinking, I gotta get rid of that. All right, that was basically what he was put in charge of. Yeah. So if like prohibition isn't illegal anymore and it was because of immigrants, then why didn't they legalize that again themselves? Well it wasn't and, and actually we're gonna go more into prohibition when we get to the social side. It wasn't just because of immigrants, but that falls into one of the reasons why we would outlaw it. So but like if those things about immigrants aren't in, in like they're not in effect anymore, then like why why is that because of the case about the people? Because people are still against like well, so there, when we go, there's other reasons why. It wasn't just immigrants. Um, is there more violence when there's alcohol involved? No. Yeah. I mean, I know none of you have ever seen any alcohol involved in there, but are there sometimes, have you heard, that there's sometimes a little more fights that occur when people have been drinking? Okay. <laughs> and that would be one of the reasons that we would have half have, have problem. We're going to go more with prohibition, get out on the social okay. side. I don't think it makes much sense how they would outlaw both alcohol and marijuana and then they well, should, yeah, they one. I don't think well, well part of this will come back to money and what tax money can be brought in. All right, credit and a false sense of prosperity. Both consumers and businesses use a lot of credit. Here's going to be, and again, I'm kind of touching upon this. When we get to the Great Depression, I go a little bit more into what are some of the causes. So kind of giving an introduction of some of the causes that we have. For a lot of the Americans, one of the ways you buy stuff is the installment plan. And the installment plan is simply you pay in installments. Buy this TV for $500, and but instead of you having to have $500 in cash, you pay $10 down and $50 a month for X amount of months. That's making installments. And when things are going good and you know, hey, I've gotten a raise the last three years, I'm probably going to get a raise next year. 
and you want to get that now. So it's easy credit. Even stocks. Now, only our richest people were buying stocks. It wasn't as common as it is today, where your parents, probably the majority of you in here, your parents own stocks, either directly or indirectly, with their retirement account, probably for most of the people in here. But at that time, it wasn't. Only the very richest people did stocks. But you could go, and this is where we could go over about buying on margin later on. You could buy stocks basically on a loan. Why pay $10,000 to buy stocks when you can buy $10,000 worth of stock for $1,000 and take out a loan for $9,000? Stocks are going to just keep going up. So as long as the money goes up, I repay that loan, and I use someone else's money to make money. That's easy money. Yeah. Except for what happens when the stock market, instead of going up, it suddenly goes down. What is it again? What's the money? With basically, for the stock market, what makes it go down is people think the economy is going to go back. Basically, the balloon burst. And you're riding that roller coaster up. So basically, you everybody fall. buying in at one time. Yeah, you're time. thinking it's going to get better. And, there, and then what it comes is the time that people realize, wait, it really isn't this good. And then people come to a realization of that. And then, and it could be one or two crimes. Usually, there's a banking crisis involved. Last time that our stock market dropped dramatically in 2007, 2008, we had a banking crisis. Since that time, when we hit a, hit a bottom, which was basically in the first month of President Obama's presidency, we actually now in the last four years, the stock market has increased 80%. If you would have put a whole bunch of money in, in, in the stocks when Obama became president, you would have made a lot of money for it sitting there. Now, what does that mean for the next four years, 10 years? Are we going to keep going up? Or are we going to go? I mean, you know what, and that's where you don't know for sure. That as more people put their money into the stock market, keep going up. But then when people say, oh, wait, it's not good. The economy is going to go down. They start pulling their money out. And then it sinks out. All right, here are some of the other problems we have. What does it mean by uneven distribution of wealth? There's a poverty right. And gap. this is where we go back even before the progressive progressive age. I remember in um, the one section of notes that we had, Carnegie had where he made, I mean, the second richest man in the history of the United States. Meanwhile, the average worker is making just over five hundred dollars a year. And so there was that extreme. We do have, and this is what we've had in the last few years, is the difference between the rich and poor film, but nothing close to what we had in the 1920s. Um, and that just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger um, in here. We also had corporate pop profits. Corporations were making a lot of, lot of money um, there. And again, the income tax that we have. Meanwhile, we're cutting the income tax. One reason why they were making, getting more money was the fact that we were cutting their taxes. And here's where you look to see what, what are they actually investing more money back into the, what would create this wealth. Consumerism and advertising effects. Here's where we're going to kind of get a little bit upon the social side of this. I wanted to keep up with the Joneses. We have all these new products coming about after World War I. We wanted to get the newest icebox. That company, General Electric, is now making appliances and all these electrical things. What if your neighbor got them a bucking bull to the ride? You want to buy one of those? Do you have a lot of stuff sometimes sitting at your house that's just useless junk? And sometimes you might have got it because somebody else had it. I mean, you might look and say, that's us for America. Which we're going to find there are people writing and saying, wait a minute, we became too materialistic. And we're going to see this coming in. We have people that write today about it. Um, you're going to see history repeat itself. The 20s, the 50s, the 80s, today. There's a lot of things that kind of are going to be again. Plus, a new product comes out. Your car is three years old. Do you really want it? And by the way, it's easy to get. Got loans, easy credit. Go out there and get it. Uh, some of you might be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, that sounds way too much like today. And there are people today are predicting and saying, oh, well, we have this, this, and this, looking like we're going to get a stock market crash again and a, and a great recession. And there are signs in our life, but there are also other signs that are different. 
Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into that, that right now. All right, here's what I want to see with advertising. And I, I think these are kind of funny. Did a woman want to be skinny in the 1920s? No. Yes. Well, no. They, they wanted to be curvy. Right. If you were skinny, what did it mean? You're poor. You're poor. You're, poor. Yeah. You're not able to eat enough. You don't want to be fat, okay? But you want to show you're able to. You don't want to be skinny. Um, just like in, in the early part of the 1900s, did you uh, did you want to be tan if you're a white person? No. Who were the tan people? The workers. The, yeah, the ones that had to work outside. So if you were a woman and you had to, even if you're a farmer and go outside and work, you're going to get nice and tan. But if your family has enough money, then you stay inside. You don't have to do manual labor. There. Um, would Santa Claus be selling cigarettes today? <laughs> All right. It makes kids husky. Michelle Obama will, be, will go with that campaign, right? All right. We need to get our kids, get some meat on their bones. All right. Maybe you have an Italian grandmother. Okay. All right. Um, all these physicians say luckies are less irritating. Okay, it's good for your throat. <coughs> So they wanted to be skinny and pale. <laughs> or I mean, they wanted to be big and pale. Yeah. Nowadays, they want to be skinny. And smoke cigarettes to help for your health. Yeah. People are part. All right, I have a part here for Florida. The 1920s were good and bad for the state of Florida. We will have boom times in the early 1920s. Uh, in 1910, there was hardly anybody living in what is Miami today. 1920, the railroad would reach down there and we would end up with this huge land boom. The area that's around South Beach today, a lot of those Art Deco houses were built, or Art Deco hotels all were built in the 1920s. Uh, and people were selling land sight unseen because there was advertisements up north to buy this land. And people would just buy it because, hey, it's gotta be great. Because you know, everybody lives on the beach in Florida. Um, just like probably some of you, if you talk to somebody from 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 up north, and they they think of you, they're like, they probably think you live right on the beach. Either that or Disney World's right next door. <laughs> okay, I mean it's, uh, but that's where we had this great and this land boom. But we have a couple things happen that make it work. First, first of all, we will have the land bust. Because when people started coming down to see the land that they had bought sight unseen and realized that they just paid a whole lot of money for swamp land. And whoever was holding the paper last on that exchanging of the, the property, you lose. Because where you might have bought that land for $5,000, it's realistically only worth twenty five. dollars uh, But people, if you, basically whoever, and that's what was happening with that one ball. The other thing that happened was we had a whole bunch of hurricanes, and that's what this map is showing, where we would have hurricanes hit one after another. And the and state of Florida, between the land, the land bust and the hurricanes, we actually went into, into the Great Depression several years before the rest of the nation. Um, there are several days. We had a push for things to move the capital at that time uh, down to dif different areas. Uh, there was a little bit of a a push to say we should move it right in this area. Um, Hernando is essentially the center of the state. So those of you living up, up in Hernando, all right, that should be the state capital, right? But there was a push that time. Um, different states, different areas. Um, some of you know of Halley in the Hills that is nearby in Lake County. They actually were pushing to be the capital of Okeechobee, because people were moving down to Miami. They actually built a boulevard there to make Okeechobee the state capital. Um, there was a push for it to go at that time. But again, we after the hurricanes or anything else, Florida would be devastated at that time. Um, uh, like I said, I don't want to section. So. All right, and that's the end of that section of notes. <laughs>